what is this place? You know, uh, we are the oldest eco-village in the world. We are an intentional community, which means we have disabled and non-disabled people living and working here. Um, and then we, we can ask, uh, is it an institution for disabled people? Or is it a company that sells bread and tomatoes? And, uh, you know, the guest houses? Is it a village for people? Or is it, you know, what is this? So we always, sometimes we're scratching our heads, wondering. Uh, and we are, this says here, this says, sustainable community, Sjálfbært samfélag, sustainable community. And we can ask ourselves, how sustainable are we, really? I told you before we're sustainable regarding hot water. But we're not sustainable regarding our food, our finances. But we are very sustainable regarding social matters. Because the people that live here, they don't really need to go elsewhere to, to have social activities. We have... Um, we have a church here, we have uh, our canteen here, we have all kinds of different activities regarding music and theatre and art. So in that sense, if you think about sustainability in, in uh, uh, environmental matters, in social matters or in uh, financial matters, then we are mostly sustainable regarding the social. Okay, and this place, um, it all started with this lady. Of course, it was a lady who founded such a wonderful place. Her name was Cecilia Renti Sigmundsdóttir, and this house is named after her. Uh, she was born in 1902 in Iceland, and uh, <clears throat> wherever since she was a child, she was always very caring. She always wanted to take care of others. She was always concerned about others' uh, feelings and, and uh, being. She also loved animals. And here you can see her holding two kittens. And here she's pictured with her family, four years old maybe. And here she's also holding a kitten. And when the picture was taken, she grabbed the cat from the floor and said, this cat is just as important as anyone else in this family. So of course he should be in the picture. And it shows how, how she was, you know, you know, how she thought about animals. At this time, people weren't like pictures, they weren't pictured with their pets like they are today. And it also shows how her family supported her. And they all, they supported her throughout her life, both her parents and her siblings in, in her work. Um, Cecilia had a, a vision when she was a teenager that she was going to open up a, an orphanage or a children's home because she just knew that there were children in Reykjavik that needed help and, you know, the community or society, they didn't have much uh, options for them. So she thought, I'm, I'm going to be the one that rescues these children, and I'm going to go and, and uh, open up an orphanage. So she went to Stuttgart, a uh, young woman, to study how to run an or orphanage or run a children's home. And this was very unusual at that time for young women, especially also for young men, to go abroad to study. So she was a very remarkable person, very stern. She, was just, she just did what she aimed for. Um, when she was in uh, Germany, she got to know the theories of Rudolf Steiner. And have you heard about Rudolf Steiner? Yeah. So he was a very remarkable person as well. And Cecilia got very interested in, in his, uh, his theory. And she decided to stay for another year just studying Steiner. And she learned how to take care of the disabled, how to take care of children, and about biodynamic farming. And then she found that Solheimer based on, on Rudolf Steiner's theories. And we are the first intentional community, and we're 85 years old this year. And now we have 200 places in 35 countries. And the, the next one after Solheimer is Järna in Sweden, and then Camp Hill in Scotland. And you find Camp Hill everywhere in the UK and on the east coast of the US. And we have friends in these communities, and uh, we visit them, and they visit us, and we learn from each other. It's very important. So, um, going back a little bit, Cecilia is in, in, uh, she's in uh, Germany. She's asking uh, for help to find a, a good place for this uh, 
children's home. She didn't want it to be an institution in Reykjavik. She wanted to be a farm so she could live there together with the children. They could all live together and work together. And she said, we need a hot spring on the site. And here you can see the steam from the hot spring. So she comes here uh, in 1930 uh, together with uh, 10 children to begin with. And these children, they were um, in two groups. Some of them were orphans or they needed to get away from their homes permanently. But others just needed to get away for the summer, like a summer camp. Uh, this house wasn't built. There was no house on site when she came here. This house was built uh, in the first year. There was only a rundown turf house up here. So she comes here with these children and she put up tents for everyone to live in. And the house, they started building the house, but it wasn't ready until November. So she, they had to stay in, in tents until November. You can see the weather. Did you hear the weather last night? It was just mental. So uh, living in a tent at this year is not very nice, but she, um, to make it easier for everyone, she put a wooden floor in the tent and had hot water uh, in pipes from the well underneath the floor. So she was a pioneer in, in floor heating also in Iceland. Uh, things went well to begin with. Um, but I think people thought she was a little bit strange, this woman. She was living alone. She was unmarried. Uh, she was living like far away from everything and taking care of children and taking care of also disabled children, which people thought was very strange. Because at that time, uh, disabled people, they were just kept away. They didn't, they didn't really do anything for them. They weren't training them or, or helping them in any way. They were just kept safe somewhere. So Cecilia had these two houses. This was uh, the house for uh, the healthy children. And she lived there. And then you had another house for the disabled children and some staff members that lived with them there. Uh, and then all day long, the children were just playing together. They had their meals together and everything. But the child authorities thought that this was not good. They said it's very bad for a healthy child to see how a disabled child behaves because they will just lose their minds if they see it. And this was like in 1940. So. So she was asked to please build a big wall between these two houses so uh, they, you know, they will not meet each other, they will not see each other as children. Uh, but Cecil didn't want to have none of that, he knew this, this was nonsense. So every time the child authorities came to put, put up a fence, she would just tear it down. But then in the end they made her like build a wall and then she made it this high. So the, the kids just jumped over it anyway. So she, was, uh, she had a little bit of struggle with the authorities. Another thing the authorities didn't um, agree with was that she kept feeding the children with vegetables. She had a lovely kitchen garden beneath the old house. Here you can see the steam coming from the well. So the, the, the vegetables were heated partly so, uh, and easier to grow them. And she was growing a lot of vegetables that she had learned to grow in Germany. But in Iceland, people didn't know any vegetables. They only knew potatoes and turnips and kale, maybe, and rhubarb. And everything else was just animal fodder. So she was asked, don't feed the children with animal fodder. It's bad for them. But she was very stern and she knew that she was doing the right thing. And we all know today that it's good to eat your vegetables, right? So she was, she was just ahead of her time. So she got into a lot of dispute with authorities. Uh, things were very difficult here for decades, but then uh, things got better eventually. <clears throat> here you can see some uh, pictures of the children when they're uh, performing and learning music. There was a lot of uh, art lessons and music lessons uh, at Sonimar. But I think the kids here learned more than the kids in Reykjavik about music. She all, all, always used uh, like art and creativity to go, get through a person. And then these children, they grew up and became elderly. Today we have a lot of elderly people living at Solimar that used to be, that came here as children. And this is one of them, this is Arman. You'll meet him in, during lunch. 
he uh, he is the one who cle clears the table after lunch, and he also is also working in the in the weavery. He loves in knitting and, and weaving. He's very proud of his work. He's always smiling, always happy. And he's been here since uh, he was a young a young a young boy. Um, so today we have 100 people living at Solheimar. Uh, out of them are 43 disabled. And this is what it looks like. This is the old Solema house. And uh, somewhere in the trees here is the house for the disabled children. And we have the greenhouses here, organic production, uh, both uh, fruits and uh, bushes and trees, um, herbs. Um, here you have the art workshops that we'll visit. This is the shop and the cafe. Here is the canteen where you will have your meals. Uh, the pool is here, very important. Uh, and then you have the residents just living out here. Here is the church, your guest house, and this is the, uh, another guest house we have. And then this is the house for the volunteers. We have a lot of volunteers living at Solheimar. Very important people to us. So this is the ideology of Solemar to give the individual an opportunity and focus on the possibilities and not the limitations. And this is really Cecilia's thinking. And Solheimar is here. We are the, like the, the disabled people are the core of Solheimar and we are here to make sure that they are okay and they have a good chance to grow and prosper and, and have a different kind of jobs. You know, they, they can pick tomatoes, make art, they can work in the shop, work in the kitchen, you know. So there are different things they can do. They're not only putting pens in a box or magazines in a folder or something like some di other disabled people have to do all day, which is just really sad. Uh, reverse integration means that we have to adapt to their needs. The non-disabled have to adapt to the disabled. And this is, we do this in different ways. You'll see in the, in the art workshops, everything is really calm, you know, they just, there's no stress around them. Here you have the workshops, art, wood, weavery, candle, ceramics, and herbs. And in all of them, they, they use recycling. Here they're making paper bowls out of office paper. Here they make uh, little uh, toys out of small wood that can't be used for anything else than burning. In the weavery, they make um, floor mats out of recycled bed linen. In the candle workshop, people give us burnt down candles and we recycle them. The ceramics, they recycle all the clay they can. And in the herbal workshop, they're making soaps and lotion and, 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 and creams and different oils out of uh, organic herbs that are picked on site or grown in the greenhouses. And you'll find this in your bathrooms. Uh, we have a culture festival running. Uh, exhibitions, concerts, uh, different lectures and uh, theatre play. And this brings a lot of people to Solheimar. We have a lot of tourists here every summer. Now it's very empty. But in the summertime we have just people uh, going through here, going to the shop, going to the coffee house, which brings more income to us. And in this house we are... Uh, um, use, we use these facilities for education, so we really like when we have groups using the guest houses that use these facilities. We are trying not to have only tourists running through here, not knowing really what Solomon is all about. We would like people to like stay, use these facilities for learning, especially about environmental matters, so you, you guys are ideal. We have a, a university group, CEL, um, these are the guys that just came in here briefly and then they went out again for a walk. They are here for uh, one, uh, for three months. Uh, it's a study abroad program, really, really interesting. They, they um, come here, stay here for one semester uh, with their teachers and they learn about sustainability, environmental matters. And they're also learning Icelandic, learning history of Iceland and all kinds of things. And they are, get integrated in the community. They get to work with us and everything. So that's a, very, that's a very popular program. And then we have all the volunteers. We have around 10 volunteers at any time. Some are staying for three months, six months, a whole year. And they're very important to us. Um, 
and very lively group, always fun around them. These are people that are interested in living in an eco-village and they give their work to Solemar and they are also teaching us a lot of things and we are teaching them so it goes back and forth. And some of them, they, they just don't want to leave, you know. <laughs> we can't get rid of them. They just stay here as staff members, which is also excellent. 